Without input and output, well, a processor's just a chunk of silicon. So what constitutes I.O.? At a minimum, you could have a push button and an LED, right? Um, if you've got a computer, hey, a keyboard and a monitor and a mouse are pretty nice. Having a game console, well, a nice big monitor, some speakers, and a controller are really helpful. You might be surprised, however, to figure out that I.O. might constitute a hard drive or a solid state drive or a network card or a video card. All of these things are considered I.O. from the processor's point of view. How does the processor communicate with this I.O. though? Well, in episodes 69 and 70, we did talk about something called, well, the memory bus. And the memory bus had three components to it. So coming out of the processor, so you have a microprocessor here, you have a bi-directional set of wires, both directions going into and out of the processor that carried data. And then in order to point to a specific address that the data was contained at, we also had a set of wires coming out of the processor that contained address. And then we also had a set of wires coming out of the processor, should have made my processor a little bigger here, that provided control. Now, the control, that, that was a little bit more difficult to explain. We had some wires that, cont that controlled whether we were reading data or whether we were writing data. So there was an R bar, which was an active low signal that if it was zero, that meant that we were bringing data in to the processor from memory. Then there was W bar, write bar, which was an active low signal that said that we were writing to memory. And there are other signals such as clock signals. So how did that act with memory? How did that, how did that pertain to memory? Well, we also presented this thing called a memory map. Now a memory map was actually, well, a map of all the elements or all the addresses in the range that was possible to be addressed by the processor. And so we had the lowest address down here at the bottom and the highest address up here at the top. All right. Now, if you wanted to access a particular element in memory, well, you put the address on the address lines and that address pointed to a specific memory location inside of this full memory map. Well, it turns out that IO typically is inter interacted with in the same method. We give an address where a specific IO a device is located and there may be a full range of addresses. Let's start with something really, really simple. Let's assume that we have something called a bi-directional port and it's just 8 bit. So I'll just say 8 bit bi-directional port. And so coming out of the out of this port, so there's a piece of hardware which allows us to either output 8 bits or input 8 bits or some combination of that. So coming out of this port, we have eight lines and maybe here we have a couple of lines that are controlling some LEDs. Maybe we have a couple of inputs that are coming from switches and in some array of inputs and outputs that are after that, okay? Now, the couple of things that we need to have in order to interact with this port. The first thing that we need to have is something called a data direction register. Now, it may go under different names, but that's kind of a general idea of what this memory location would act as. So it would be a data direction register, which would be, oh, I don't know, that might be eight bits to identify, oh, let's just go ahead and put the eighth connection there. All right. So it may be eight bits. All right. And each one of the input pins coming from this bi-directional eight bit port um, may be a zero 
means that it's an output. And a one means that it would be an input. All right. Now, if you look at this 8-bit port, and we've got these, these eight connections that are coming from this 8-bit port, the first two, and let's just go ahead and say that this top one here is the most significant bit. These first two are both outputs. So in the data direction register, we would store zeros in the positions that correspond to those two bits. The next two, those are inputs from switches or buttons. So we put ones there. Then we have an output, an input, and two more outputs. All right. Now, how do we set that? How do we configure that inside of this 8-bit port? Well, that particular register, this data direction register, would be assigned a memory location. Now, we'll talk a little bit more later in this lesson about what that means, what that entails, but basically there is a memory location that has an address that we store that 8-bit value in. And as soon as we store that 8-bit value, the logic that's inside of this 8-bit port configures those bits so that they are set up correctly. All right. Now we also might have something called, and I've kind of run out of room already, a data register. Now, this data register actually acts kind of funny. And, and by the way, this is just kind of an example of what you might see uh, and, and not really a real device that I'm talking about. But the data, the data direction register identifies things as input and output. Whenever it comes to the actual data register itself, well, that might serve two different functions. So for example, if I wanted to send data to the LEDs and these other outputs, I would write values to this data register. And so I would write the value, uh, let's say I wanted to turn both LEDs on, and we'll talk about hardware later. You don't necessarily turn LEDs on with ones, but let's just say we want to turn on those two bits. Um, these two bits really don't matter because those are inputs. But then we have another output. Let's say we want to make that one zero and then two more outputs. Maybe we want a one and a zero. Okay. Now, What's funny about this is if I write to the if I write to this register, I still have to have values in those guys. Well, the logic inside of this I/O port will automatically say, well, any input values, those are going to be ignored. They don't care. We don't care what they're going to be. So let's just go ahead and put zeros there, just to put bits there. And so the configuration of this I.O. port, we might have a memory address that we write to to control the direction of each one of those bits, all right? Then we have another register, which is another memory location that we write to in order to set the values for the bits that we had identified as outputs. What about the inputs? Well, the inputs, we read the data register. And so if I want to read the data register and these values that I had originally said were don't cares, maybe these come back, a couple of them come back as ones. Maybe another one comes back as zeros and that identifies what inputs we're getting. And so what we've got now is a way of acting with the outside world and way of inputting and outputting just general binary values. All right. Now, reading reads the inputs. It also may look at the outputs and just simply return to us the last value that we wrote. So reading yeah, you actually have two functions there. We can read the inputs and read the last value written to the outputs. And then the data direction register would control the direction. All right, just a little example. Two memory locations. And that's how we, and that's how we would interact with this I.O. Now let me clear a little space here because there are some, some nuances that I'd like to cover. Now, there are three ways that we can create this interface between the processor and this, these I.O. devices. 
First of all, we have something called isolated I.O. Now, isolated I.O. means that the, the memory, and when I talk about the memory, I'm talking about the interaction that the processor has with its stored values out in main memory. Memory and I.O. are in separate um, separate memory spaces or address spaces. Now there are two ways that this could be implemented. So let's talk about the methods of implementation. All right, first of all, we could have a separate set of, of everything. So separate set of data, address, and control lines. All right. So now think about this because we have, first of all, an enormous number of address and data lines already coming out of the processor to interact with memory. And what we're proposing here with this first method is to basically create a whole nother bus interface. So it'll have a whole new set of address lines, a whole new set of data lines, a whole new set of control lines, which means coming out of the processor, there are a lot of pins, a lot of wires. But that does have a benefit. And one of the benefits of this is that I can communicate to memory and to I.O. at the same time. There is something called the von Neumann bottleneck. And the von Neumann bottleneck basically says that since if we get everything out of our main memory, our, our code and our data and everything, then it all has to come in through that one door, through that one set of lines. And so if you're trying to do a lot of exchange of data and information, there's, there's going to be some, some traffic running on that bus and cause a lot of delays, all right? Now, if I have completely separate, a completely separate set of connections going to memory and a completely set of connections going to I.O. separate, I can do both at the same time and give myself a lot better throughput. The problem is, is it comes at a cost, there's a lot of pins. So, better throughput but a lot of pins or connections, right? Let's talk about the second way. The second way says we are going to share data and address with memory, all right? So the same set of wires, and this was really the bulk of the connections, right? The address lines and the data lines. So this means that we are going to communicate with memory and with I.O. across those same address and data lines. But what we're going to have is separate control. And what this does is it makes it so that I have two memory maps. So once again, memory and I.O. are in separate address spaces. So I have one memory map that just has memory. And then I have another memory map, probably smaller, because what it's going to do is not take advantage of all the address lines coming out of the processor, but it's going to have a separate set of control lines so that whenever we do reading and writing, that memory, the main memory, the memory map, is not going to hear any R bar or W bar. It's going to have a separate set of control lines that are going to interact with I.O. So by having two memory maps, then you're not taking up space inside of the main memory map. You're not taking space up for your I.O. That gives you a little bit broader amount of space in term, in, to work with in terms of memory. But in the case of sharing data and address lines, we, we've now got, you know, we don't have that throughput that we got with separate set of address lines and data lines with the first, the first method. Now, both of these methods, and I know we haven't talked about assembly language yet, but both of these methods require a separate set of commands 
to access the I.O. Now, by requiring a separate set of commands to access the I.O., um, the, 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 the commands that we would use to interact with memory, those are reserved for communicating with the one main memory map, okay? Whereas the commands that are used for I.O., those are going to be used just to communicate with I.O. Now, it's been a very long time since I've program, programmed on any of the Intel platforms, but you have two separate commands. For memory, you move things back and forth with a command called move. For the I.O., you communicate with an in and an out command. So memory communicates with move, in and out communicates with I.O. So they control this, the, the separation. So they share, the, it shares the data and address with memory, but it has separate control lines. So the move command has some R, has an R bar and W bar command of itself, or excuse me, control line of itself. Whereas in and out had, I think it was I O R C and I O W C, something like that. I may have those names quite, not quite right. And those were active low. And so it was a completely set of con different set of control lines in order to communicate with I.O. Also, so we, ha we had the shared uh, data and address coming out of the Intel processor, but it only, it limited, the older ones specifically limited the number of address lines that were used. Let's talk about a third one um, after I make some room on this board. Okay, now the third one is referred to as memory mapped I.O. Memory mapped I.O. How does memory mapped I.O. work? Well, it also requires data, address, and control lines. But the difference is, is it shares the control, data, and address lines with memory. All right. Now, this is very common, especially with like an embedded system. So you look at the memory map for an embedded system or any of these processors that use memory mapped I.O. And so you're looking at the memory map going from all zeros to all ones. And a portion of the memory map is reserved for I.O. Now, there are some significant differences here, and the main one being that now we don't have a separate set of assembly language instructions. We don't have a separate set of controls in order to access I.O. So everything that you can do with main memory, including bringing items into the cache anywhere in the memory hierarchy, all of those are available to a device with, uh, that uses memory mapped I.O. Everything. The problem is, is that comes at a cost. And the cost is, is that now a chunk of my full memory map is being taken up for I.O. All right. So those are the three primary ways that we use memory address lines, data lines, and control lines to actually interact with I.O. In the next lesson, we will talk a lot more about how to implement memory mapped I.O and how you might see it implemented on the processors that you program on.